But we get to walk as one, as a congregation ourselves, as a congregation among congregations in this city. We get to walk as one in the call that God has on our personal lives, on our ministry, on our congregation, on our city. And it seems like in the world today, it's harder than ever to walk in unity on anything. You know, funny story. So for, a, a, for the time being, for a short time, there's a Congolese church. Pastor Charles, some of you have met them, are, are using our kids' church in the afternoons for their services until we can help them get situated on a long-term space. And if you've ever been around either for some of their prayer meetings or, uh, or their services, there'll be a little piece of you that wonders if you're even saved when you see them worship. There's just a little piece of you like, am I actually there? <laughs> they worship with such a fierce heart posture for the, for the presence of God. It's incredible. But so I get this email a week and a half ago. And one of our neighbors was not happy. And they made it very clear they were not happy. Haven't, you know, I don't know all the circumstances and whatnot, but very clear uh, scathing email that they were not happy. And then it turned out that because it was getting warm in the kids' church, they had opened up the doors. And their, the ferocity of their worship was extending to the neighborhood. It's like, you can't be mad, right? But this neighbor was particularly angry about this. So we respond, and we respond in grace, and we explain, you know, and all these things. The next day, Sierra comes to me. She says, hey, I talked with one of our neighbors. And this particular neighbor, different neighbor, said, man, I don't know what goes on Sunday afternoons, but I just sit on my back porch, and I can feel whatever they're singing. I just feel something in it. And not a believer, but she's like, she, she tells Sierra, you tell the higher ups, they don't, don't change anything. You keep it going. <laughs> but sometimes as a pastor, you have these situations where one person thinks it's the worst thing on earth and one p person is telling you don't change a thing about it. It's hard to walk in unity in the world that we live. And just imagine for a second when you have a, a body of people, hundreds of people, of all places in the Pacific Northwest, in the city of Seattle, of all times during an election year, imagine the amount of tension there is that the enemy is trying to tear apart the body of Christ through offense, through disappointment, through missed expectations. It's a challenging thing for a body of people in such a divided world to say, hey, we're going to be bound to Christ, and we're going to walk in unity together. It's a challenging thing. It doesn't just happen by going with the flow. It doesn't just happen because all the stars align and everybody gets together. But we have the opportunity, just like Christ, to walk in unity with the Father as we carry out the purposes of God's heart in our city. If we're not walking united with God, we don't have a chance to walk united with each other. The nature of the world, the systems of the world will pull us apart. If we're not grounded on Christ, if we're not willing to stand on Christ and his word unwaveringly and to daily seek his heart in the secret place. Notice when we read about Jesus, the, the imprint of God's nature, the image of the invisible God, he rarely did things the exact same way. So today, he could call us to fulfill a purpose in one way, and tomorrow, he could call us to fulfill the same purpose a different way. But if we're not united with the Father, if we're not in step with what he's doing and what he's saying, we might take a good idea and replicate it and miss what God's wanting to do in a situation. It takes daily weaving together as we wait on the Lord, like Pastor Beverly preached a couple months ago. As we wait on the Lord, we bind ourselves to him. We're not just passively waiting for him to do something. We're binding ourselves to him and then walking 
from that place of union with his spirit and his presence as we go out into the world. We get to walk united with Christ together. Jesus modeled what it was, what it looks like to walk as a man in unity with the Father. You realize that when Jesus walked this earth, he wasn't just pushing people aside to try and get to the end goal so he could get back to heaven. He was actually modeling something for his disciples, for his sons and daughters to walk in when he was gone. He was walking in a way that we could follow. In John 5, 19, he just got done healing the lame beggar at the pool of Bethesda. And people are not happy because it was the Sabbath and because he's alluding to the fact that he's, he's God. Not, not happy about it, right? But in John 5, 19 and 20, it says, Jesus said to them, truly, truly, I say to you, the son can do nothing of his own accord, but only what he sees the father doing. For whatever the father does, the son does likewise. For the father loves the son and shows him all that he himself is doing. And greater works than these will be shown him so that you may marvel. So Jesus was the son of God. He was deity. He was the son of God and he was also the son of man. 100% God and 100% man. And he was walking as a model, as a picture of what it looks like to walk as a man in unity with the Father. Saying, for whatever the Father does, the Son does likewise. Where the Father's moving, he moved. The things God was doing, he did. He modeled for us what it looks like to walk in that unity on a daily basis. Yet with that, he was regularly getting alone with the Father. He regularly went out alone, off into his own, and he sought the Father. He prayed. He communed with the Father. He was unrushed by the things that people wanted him to rush about. Even though the people in the culture around him wanted him to operate a certain way, he didn't operate that way. He operated the way he saw the Father operating. He was unafraid of the things that people were afraid of. He didn't operate in the fear of man. He operated in the fear of God, like we're called to operate. But not only did he look for what the Father was doing, he also listened for what the Father was saying. We read John 12, 29, For I have not spoken on my own authority, but the Father who sent me has himself given me a commandment, what to say and what to speak. He wasn't just coming and speaking off the cusp, everything that he felt or thought in the moment. He was actually speaking exactly what he was commissioned to by the Father. So he did what he saw the Father doing. He spoke what he saw the Father, heard the Father speaking. Now Jesus desires that we would walk in the same way, united with the Father and united with each other as a picture of the Father. We get to John 17, verse 20. Jesus is in Gethsemane. And he's praying shortly before going to the cross. And he prays this. I do not ask for these only, but also for those who will believe in me through their word. He's praying for us. Those that would believe based off of the disciples' testimony. That they may all be one, just as you, Father, are in me and I in you. That they also may be in us, so that the world may believe that you sent me. So he's praying, I pray that they are all one. Not for just the sake of holding hands, but because it reflects the nature of the Father and the Son and the Spirit being united as, as God. 
So he's contending that we would walk in both, united with the Father in our personal life and united with each other for what purpose? That the world may believe that you sent me. I don't believe that this next statement applies to all circumstances, but I believe there are a lot of people in the world that don't believe that Jesus was sent by God because they don't see the unity of the body. They see a lot of things from the body of Christ, but they don't often see genuine supernatural unity under the banner of Christ. Because Jesus said, if they see our unity, they'll believe that Jesus was sent by God. When we're united with the Father, we begin to care about what he cares about. We begin to think about what he thinks about. We begin to overflow and act the way Jesus acted. Our hearts begin to burn for what his heart burns for. When we weave ourselves together, when we bind ourselves to him, When we cast the body of Christ aside and settle for something less, we're actually casting aside something that he deeply desires for his bride. I remember in John 5, 20, he said, For the Father loves the Son and shows him all that he himself is doing. So the Father is revealing to Jesus what he's doing. Then we get to John 15, 15, where we see that Jesus brings us in to the Father's business. He says, no longer do I call you servants, for the servant does not know what his master is doing. But I have called you friends. For all that I have heard from my Father, I have made, made known to you. He's inviting us in to the same unity with his Spirit. That we can actually be about our father's business as sons and daughters that carry his authority and have been commissioned to be salt and light on this earth. We can actually press in and seek Jesus to reveal what the father's doing. Because he says, I don't call you slaves. I don't call you servants. A servant wouldn't know what his master is doing, but I'm welcoming you in to understand what the master is doing. We have access to seek out what the Father's doing. And there's so much more than what we're currently walking in right now. There's so much more. We've only scratched the surface of what God invites us into as his kids, as his sons and daughters. And we're going to press deeper. We're going to dig because the enemy would like nothing more than to hold us back from all that God desires to do in and through us. He would love for us to settle. He would love for us to compromise. But we're going to dig. We're going to press in because there's so much more. As we go into the independent spirit, if you feel deeply offended, I would propose to you it's spiritual. We're not here to just play church. We're not here to just pat people on the back and say, see you next week. We're here to, we're here to dig. We're here to grow. Because God has so much more. So we're going to talk today about breaking the independent spirit. Now God, or excuse me, not God, the devil works differently in different places around the world. You go to certain con uh, continents, excuse me, you go to different continents, you'll see a very different work of the enemy than here in America. Why is that? Certain continents, they're dead poor, they're in poverty. What is materialism and consumerism going to do in an impoverished nation? So he works very blatantly, witchcraft, all kinds of demonic stuff, witch doctors, everything. 
Here in America, he often works through materialism, consumerism, independent spirit. He works differently. He's crafty. He's been around for a while. He's been around the block once or twice. And he's very strategic, very particular about how he'll try and get each one of us to settle. And each one of us to separate ourselves, to compromise. Functioning in an independent spirit is counter to the gospel of Jesus. Everything about the gospel, everything about what Jesus did was bringing us in restoration of relationship. Jesus came that we would be restored to the Father. There was only one way. Jesus paid the price that we would be restored into relationship. And Jesus himself desires that the body of Christ would resemble the relationship that we've been restored to through each other. So that the world would know that Jesus was actually sent by God through what they see in his body. We're called to be in relationship with him, dependent on him. And we're called to be in relationship with his bride. As different parts, different callings, different pieces. But walking as one. And it's not just a casual passing by relationship that God's inviting us into. God is so intentional. He's so purposeful. God is so deep. We, don't even, we, have, we have no clue how deep God is. And yet sometimes we write it off as like, oh, I checked that box. And sometimes we try and make arguments as to why we've checked the box and why we don't actually need to be rooted in the body of Christ. And if we're making those arguments, if we're trying to justify why we can diminish the heart of Jesus and what he contended for, we've already missed his heart. The fact that we're trying to justify it means we actually aren't walking in the Father's heart in this area. Some people think that being rooted in a body of believers, being rooted in a church is restrictive. You know who else believed the lie that unity is restrictive? Adam and Eve. They let the devil convince them that God was holding out on them, that their relationship with the Father, their perfect union with the Father was restrictive to who they could actually be. And he got them to step out of relationship. In reality, truly walking in unity with God and his sons and daughters, not restrictive, is actually incredibly freeing. Because it's freeing us from ourselves. It's freeing us from saying, this is the way I want it to be. To saying, this is the way I want to submit to what God's doing with a body of believers that I can walk with. Same as dying to yourself. We can believe the lie that that's restrictive, but it's actually what sets us free. Same with considering others above ourselves. It looks restrictive to us, but it actually sets us free. Because how much better it is to give than to receive. An independent spirit is actually suffocating, isolating, and restrictive to everything God desires to do in and through you in a body of people. It's actually suffocating. And sometimes there are common roots that lead to justifying independence. There's common roots or justifications for isolation. First is pride. Just like in the garden. Their pride told them, I'll be better if I go about it alone because God's just holding out. I'll be better off if I do it my way. I'll get farther. 
I'll do better. Pride was really the basis of Adam and Eve disobeying God. We know better than what you've called us to. Now, there's both religious pride and there's selfish pride. There's religious pride in thinking, man, look at all we know. Look at all we've done. Look at our programs. Look at what we've built. God would be so proud of us. Then there's selfish pride. We've all operated in both of these. There's selfish pride where we're like, I'm just going to go after what I want, when I want, what I feel, how I feel. Both are pride. They're opposite sides of the spectrum, but they're both pride. And the enemy uses pride all the time. Then there's fear and shame. In Genesis, when Adam and Eve heard God in the garden after they had sinned, he said, we heard you and were afraid because I was naked. They were afraid. There's fear and there's shame. They were naked. The enemy will use fear and shame to isolate people, to get them out of what God intends for them. And sometimes the enemy can weave these justifications that sound really nice. Sometimes it's busyness or apathy. The reason I put busyness and apathy together is that A lot of times our busyness is actually apathy to what God wants to do and pride towards what we want to do. I'd rather choose the things that I would like to do because I don't actually care that much about what God's doing. Busyness and apathy will give us justification of the enemy to say, ah, it's really not that big of a deal to be rooted somewhere. It's really not that big of a deal to actually walk in unity. Laying down what your preferences are, and actually stepping into a family knowing that it's not always going to be done your way. That's the thing. When you got family, when there's lots of kids in one room, not every kid is going to get what they want every time they want it. When you're submitting to be part of a family, you're saying, I could otherwise get what I want, but because I desire what he desires, I'm going to lay that at his feet, and I'm going to step into community. Another root or justification for the independent spirit, probably one of the most common, is offense. Offense. The enemy loves to make sons and daughters be offended at each other. It's one of his primary go-tos. You know, it's funny, you know, just being totally transparent, as a pastor, you see a lot of layers of things. I see what, you know, my responsibility is. I I meet with all my staff members regularly. I see what they're going through. I talk extensively with uh, ministry leaders, with deacons, with elders, with congregants. You see a broad scope of what's going on in in an entire body of a couple hundred people. You see a lot of layers. You see a lot of angles and perspectives. But what's really consistent is oftentimes when there's breakthrough in a really specific area, it could be an individual's life, it could be something on a team, it could be something in a congregation, the enemy has these ticking time bombs that he's waiting to set off. Because he's not ready to set them off yet, but he uses assumption, he uses pride, he uses gossip, he uses offense, and he just prepares that ticking time bomb. And I've seen it over and over again. When he needs a bomb to go off because God's doing something incredible, he knows what he's prepared ahead of time. And some people think it's random. Oh, I just couldn't hold it in anymore. And they just boom on another son or daughter. I'm like, that wasn't by accident. You got played. You got played into the enemy's hand. It doesn't mean there's condemnation. It doesn't mean there's not grace. But we should be wise. We're called to be Wise as serpents, innocent as doves. The enemy's crafty. He'll use you against yourself. If you're hoarding these offenses and these assumptions and this gossip, the enemy is using you to play into his hand. Doesn't change your identity. 
But we need to be aware of it because I don't desire to be any help to the enemy. And I'm guilty of it too. But getting someone isolated in order to take advantage of them is the oldest trick in the book. It is the oldest trick in the book. You see it on National Geographic. Who does the lion go after? He doesn't trump right into the big pack. He waits for some, you know, a gazelle or whatever it is. He waits for him to be kind of hobbling off to the side. Even animals understand the instinct of this. The enemy uses it all the time. I'll wait and I'll try and get someone offended and isolated and then I'll pounce when the time is right. I had, I had a, oh man, um, I had some friends. I won't say at what season in my life, but I had some, some friends and their family, incredible. Love the Lord, involved in everything, all kinds of stuff. But over the process of years, the father in particular decided no church around us is good enough, and so therefore, we're just going to do our own thing. And I'll be honest, for years and years, nothing happened. It looked like they were totally fine. But they became isolated because nobody else was good enough for what they were looking for in a church until his best friend committed suicide, and it crushed him. And he had so stepped out of covering, out of community, he went off the deep end. He had probably what, what you consider a psychotic breakdown. He divorced his wife. Multiple kids walked away from the Lord. It was horrendous. But for years, you would have never thought anything was wrong. But the enemy is patient. He knows if they're in a pack, it's going to be really hard. If they're out of a pack, it's just a waiting game. We okay? I know we're bringing it today. We all right? All right, all right. So what we need to do as the body of Christ is we need to bring those fears. We need to bring those struggles. We need to bring those offenses into relationship. Because if the enemy wants nothing but to separate us from relationship, we need to fight to actually bring those challenges into relationship. Because it disarms what the enemy is trying to do. Think of how Jesus operated. The adulterous woman, she gets dragged out. No sign of the man, but the woman gets dragged out. She's surrounded by a bunch of people that want to start throwing rocks and kill her. Jesus stoops down. What was that? Jesus is the exact imprint of God's nature. He's the image of the invisible God. That moment was a father-daughter moment. That moment was a father-daughter moment. Now, how many of you, if your daughter was in the middle of that circle, would have stood there with stones? But Jesus went after his daughter, and his desire was to bring his daughter back into relationship. He wasn't condoning the sin. But we, he was also postponing the payment of that sin. God is so gracious to postpone judgment. He could have judged on the onset of our sin. But he postponed our sin that we might have the opportunity to be redeemed and reconciled, which was what his desire was. It was the joy that was set before him. So he has this father-daughter moment in the midst of all the other accusers. And yet sometimes we're so quick to pick up the stone towards another one of God's sons or daughters. While he desires, he's not condoning, but he desires the relationship be restored with both you and that person. Jesus operated in the same, well, the same way, the woman at the well. Even raising Lazarus from the dead, he raised him from the dead and then he had a relationship with him. He dined with him. He raised him from the dead and then he sat and ate with him. Zacchaeus, same thing. You go through, as Jesus encountered people, he was drawing people to restored relationship. Even though they had done all kinds of things, they had messed up in all kinds of ways, Jesus was displaying the heart of a father, saying, I desire to be reunited with my kids. I'm going to invite Pastor Barry up as we close.
in this season, we're building something that's far bigger than any of ourselves. We're not here to build our own kingdom and then put God's label on it. We're here to build his kingdom. It's far bigger than any one of our lives. Any one of our desires, any one of our, God loves all those things. He loves our passions and desires. He loves the giftings that he's placed in front of, in us. And if we're willing to submit it to him, he's got the best plan with how to, how to usher those in, how to use those. But even if we take good gifts that he's given us and we put them above him, it's an idol. A good thing can absolutely be an idol. We're here for someone far greater than any one of us in this room. We're here for something far greater than any one of us could build on our own. And I believe that God can genuinely call someone to plant themselves at a church that wouldn't be their first choice. I learned this from my brother, my oldest brother. He went through the season where he... God took him through various churches in different denominations. As he was in Arizona, as he went out to school in Texas, in these different places, he went to Jordan for a while. But God took him through this season where God specifically led him to churches that wouldn't be his first pick. But what he got to see was, as he stepped into family, as he submitted himself to each church that was grounded on Christ, he got to see a different aspect and reflection of the heart of the Father that other denominations didn't exemplify the same way. He got to see the beauty of the unity of the body of Christ because he wasn't just going around looking to consume. He wasn't just going around looking for what was perfect or what his first choice would be. He was saying, God, I desire to be planted where you've called me. And if you take me to be planted somewhere else like Pastor Heather, we'll bless you and send you. We are not possessive. But we actually have the honor of, of laying down what we would choose on our own, submitting it to Jesus and responding to what he calls us to, where he calls us to, how he calls us to it. You know, there's a time where, like most of you guys know, became the lead pastor and I was still leading youth and young adults and I had incredible people who helped me carry the load. But there were times where it was very clear that the youth group that I was running was not the best it could be. It was very clear. I mean, you only have so many hours in a day. But I saw certain families knowing that there's the option to say, oh, well, I just want to be where my kids like the most, or I just want to be where they're, you know, the best youth group or whatever. I saw families like the Wooldridges, the Riversons that said, we're planted here, and we're going to ride it out, even if it's not the best. I've seen other people like, like Mark and Jan Yokers. Mark knows more scripture and more Bible than I probably ever will. I've said this before. He has every reason to say, amen. I've graduated from this. This is beneath me. I'm going to go find some incredible preacher that I can feed from. But I literally see Mark gleaning from the Holy Spirit because it's the Holy Spirit that's counseling him. The Holy Spirit doesn't need the, the greatest, most experienced pastor to do that. I see someone like Mark. It's so humbling because I'm like, he's head and shoulders above me. But he's humbled himself, and he allows the Spirit to teach him and move because God's planted him here for this season. Even some of you guys know Johnny and Eden. They have such a high degree of honor, such a high degree of respect towards being united in the body to being planted in the body. We get to walk fully submitted to Jesus, that we're connecting, we're, we're binding ourselves together with Christ and together saying, because Jesus cared about it, 
I care about it too. And I get it. There are times and seasons where the enemy has his way and he tries to blow up different things in churches and there are tough decisions that have to be made. But the desire to say, I'm submitting my own desires and preferences. I'm submitting what I think I could do better independently. I'm submitting that to God's purpose where he's called me to be planted in this season. Even this week, There was a situation that could have been really bad between different relationships. There could have been all kinds of offense. There could have been all kinds of disappointment. Really tough decision that it was like, this is probably, it could turn out to be a no-win situation. And I saw multiple couples come together submit themselves to what God was doing, even though different people desired different things. And I saw God bring resolution to it supernaturally to where once everything was said and done, the whole situation was multiple times over more powerful than it ever would have been had that obstacle not been overcome by the unity of the body of Christ. Even in the times where we've been so hurt, so let down, so misunderstood, God desires restoration of his kids, both with him and with each other. And I'll tell you, it is so hard. Some of the situations you look at and you're like, man, how did this even happen? But again, if we disarm the enemy from the onset, it takes away so much of his firepower. If he doesn't have ticking time bombs to set off at the opportune time, if he hasn't already conjured up a fence that hasn't been spoken and that hasn't been brought directly to a brother or sister, if he hasn't had time to kindle gossip, if he hasn't been given a place to get us mesmerized with materialism and consumerism, it disarms the enemy. And even though there are still obstacles and challenges, we can unite under the banner of love, under the banner of Christ, and actually walk in the fullness of what God desires to display through his bride so that the world around us would know Jesus had to have been from God because there's no way that that body of people could walk supernaturally in unity like they do. That has to be supernatural. And the world will know. So in a moment, I'm going to invite you to stand. I don't want this to just become a, everybody standing, and so I'm going to stand too. But I'm going to invite you to stand if you're willing to commit to bring offenses and struggles and obstacles into relationship. If you're saying, I'm willing to disarm the enemy, even no matter how uncomfortable this conversation seems like it will be, I'd rather go through the uncomfortability of going about it the way of Christ than to be uncomfortable when it all blows up in the enemy's hands. They're saying, I'm willing to bring struggles and trials. I'm willing to bring fears. I'm willing to bring pride. I'm willing to bring disappointment. I'm willing to bring offense into relationship with the body of Christ. That we would walk fully known and fully loved by our brothers and sisters. Something supernatural that's not just us looking for what meets our momentary desires. In a moment, you can stand if you, if you are willing to bring that tension and frustration, that misunderstanding, that conflict into relationship. And you're willing to say, I desire in this season, I desire to bind myself with the Father that I would see what he's doing and do the same. I'd hear what he's saying and I would do the same And I would walk woven together with the body of Christ. Even though they're different pieces, they're different parts, they're different skills and abilities, different callings, things that we don't see eye to eye on. But for the purpose of the desire of Christ to be displayed through his bride, I'll bring that into relationship. If that's you, would you stand?
I genuinely stand by my word that if God calls you and plants you somewhere else, I will bless it and I will send you. When God calls and when he makes it clear and he, he takes you somewhere, I'll bless and I will send you. But I encourage you, especially in the volatility of the city, in this season, in this world, do not let the enemy take advantage of the foothold of offense or disappointment that causes you to say, I'm better off independent. Don't give him that luxury. Don't give him that luxury. We're here for something that's so much bigger than ourselves. And we have the opportunity to experience something so much greater than just our momentary preferences. And we get to do that together, building the kingdom of God under the headship, under the cornerstone of Jesus himself. We're not always going to get it right. It's not always going to be picture perfect the first time. But we walk as one. It's the same way our leadership operates. We don't all think the same. We don't all have the same ideas. We don't all have the same standpoint. But when push comes to shove, when we make a decision, we've gone there and we walk in unity. Elders, staff, deacons, we walk in unity. And there are some times where it's exactly what I would have wanted. There's sometimes it's exactly what someone else would have wanted, but it's not my favorite. But we walk as one. We walk in unity under the banner of Christ. God, I thank you for what you're doing in this body. I thank you that we don't have to settle for the lies and the, the false promises of the devil. That we can actually die to ourselves. We can pick up our cross. We can follow Jesus to something so much greater, something so much more valuable in your kingdom. That Jesus, you are our treasure. You're everything that we could ever ask for. Every need is met in you. We have no lack when we walk in all that you paid for. And standing here before you, we commit to bind ourselves to you and to weave ourselves with the body of Christ that the lamb who was slain would receive the reward of his suffering, that he would be exalted, having the name that's above every other name, that Jesus, your name is above my name. Your name is above every name in this room. Every power of darkness, we exalt you, Jesus. You are why we're here. Would you come and inhabit the praises of a united people? In Jesus' name, let's sing together. I want us to close with this song that I wrote three years ago during